Hey everyone, my name is Ashley Davis and I did my case study on liver cirrhosis. Cirrhosis is considered the end stage of a variety of chronic liver diseases. Extensive damage and destruction of hepatocytes occur in response to various causes of liver injury and fibrotic bands and nodules of connective tissue give the liver a cobbly appearance. Changes in the vascular system and lymphatic bile duct channels result from compression caused by the proliferation of fibrous tissue. Here on the left, I've in, left I've included a picture of a normal liver, and on the right you can see the cirrhosis with the fibrous nodules um, all throughout the liver, which also put pressure on the blood vessels. Like I said, liver cirrhosis is the final result of various chronic uh, liver diseases that cause liver fibrosis. So examples would be alcoholism, hepatitis C and B, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, hemochromatosis and Wilson's disease, autoimmune hepatitis, and primary biliary cirrhosis. Alcoholism is affected by lifestyle mostly. Um, it's based on how much alcohol one consumes. Alcohol can become toxic and damage the cells in the liver. Hepatitis B and C are chronic viral infections and the increased inflammation due to the immune response can cause liver damage. Now non-alcoholic fatty liver disease is getting more common. Um, it's the accumulation of fat in the liver that cannot be explained by alcohol consumption. Recent studies have shown that fatty liver is associated with obesity, type 2 diabetes mellitus, and metabolic syndrome. So it is affected both by genetic and lifestyle. Um, hemochromatosis and Wilson's disease are inherited diseases. Um, hemochromatosis involves high levels of iron in the body, and Wilson's disease are excess levels of copper, and both of those can be toxic to the liver. Autoimmune hepatitis and the primary biliary cirrhosis um, are autoimmune disorders where the body attacks either the liver or the biliary epithelial cells, increase inflammation, and also and ultimately lead to cirrhosis. So there are many types of cells and cytokines that are involved in the initiation and progression of liver fibrosis. The liver is made up of non-parenchymal cells and non-parenchymal cells. So I said parenchymal and non-parenchymal cells. So first off, we're going to talk about the non-parenchymal cells. Um, the first one are the hepatic stellate cells, and they store the vitamin A and other retinoids. They are triggered and activated by the inflammatory cytokines, such as transforming growth factor, platelet-derived growth factor, tumor necrosis factor, and interleukin-1. All those cytokines activate these cells. And as they are activated, it leads to cell proliferation, the formation of the myofibroblasts, and the myofibroblasts are also involved in the production of the collagen and extracellular matrix. So they're just trying to heal up the tissue um, and it kind of creates a little scar there. And as you can um, probably guess, with all these chronic liver diseases over time, that scar tissue builds up and forms those fibrous nodules. A second kind of non parenchymal cell is the Kupfer cell, and they are known as the stellate macrophages. Um, you may remember from the immune system, we talked about macrophages, how they um, engulf bacteria, just kind of swallow it up, get rid of it. Um, these cells do that as well by detoxifying um, potential potentially harmful compounds such as drugs, alcohol, and chemicals that are ingested. Um, so viral infections, alcohol, and high levels of iron activate these cells and cause an immune response that promotes the inflammation and fibrogenesis. Also with these activated um, Kupfer cells, they release a hormone called thromboxane A2, 
and this hormone causes vasoconstriction, which leads to increased portal pressure. And we'll talk about some complications from that increased pressure here in a second. The third non-parenchymal cell is the liver sinusoidal epithelial cells, and they're characterized by fenestrae or, or little pores that facilitate the exchange of fluids and particles between the sinusoidal blood and the parenchymal cells. So chronic alcohol abuse can decrease the number of fenestrae on these cells, and this process of defenestration leads to impaired substrate exchange and hepatic dysfunction seen in liver cirrhosis. Um, there is one main type of parenchymal cell now, and that's the hepatocyte, or also known as the cell of the liver. And they are targeted by hepatitis viruses, alcohol metabolites, and bile acids. The damaged hepatocytes release reactive oxygen species, which are a byproduct of the metabolism of oxygen. They activ activate the hepatic stellate cells that we talked about earlier and stimulate the myofibroblasts. Um, over a period of time, these damaged hepatocytes um, cannot stand this damage anymore, which leads to apoptosis or cell death. And um, this contributes to tissue inflammation, the fibrogenesis, and the development of cirrhosis as well. So as all of these cells are damaged, you can see how each one is causing increased inflammation and this scar tissue buildup um, that lead to cirrhosis. And it, as it progresses, the cirrhosis just gets worse and worse. Um, here's an image um, to kind of just show you what's going on, the changes in the hepatocytes. You can see the microvilli are not present in the case of cirrhosis here on the right compared to the, the normal image on the left. Um, the stellate cells are activated. There is starting to be some scar matrix forming here. There's a loss of the fenestration or the pores between the cells, so they are unable to um, communicate. Um, and the Kupfer cell is there as well, and that's um, ready to engulf any um, harmful compound um, as the immune response continues. Um, there are many complications of cirrhosis, such as portal hypertension, esophageal varices, ascites, jaundice, splenomegaly, hepatic encephalopathy, and coagulation problems. And another major complication can be arrhythmias. I'm just going to tell you guys a little bit about each one more in detail here. Um, first off, the portal hypertension results from increased resistance or obstruction of blood flow through the portal vein. Um, and the increased portal venous pressure causes collateral circulation to divert portal blood flow from areas of high pressure within the liver to areas of low pressure outside the liver, such as the veins of the esophagus, spleen, intestines, and stomach. The thin-walled vessels of the esophagus and stomach become distended and form varices that are at risk of rupturing. Also, the increased portal hypertension can cause the spleen to become enlarged and retain white blood cells and platelets, and that leads to the splenomegaly, the enlarged spleen. Um, ascites is also another symptom of cirrhosis. That's an accumulation of fluid in the peritoneal cavity due to the increased pressure from the portal hypertension. The plasma proteins, such as albumin, pull the fluid out of the vessels and into the tissues. Um, and the impaired liver is unable to synthesize albumin and pull the fluid back into the bloodstream. Massive ascites can cause decreased urinary output, which stimulates the renin-angiotensin system. Um, another issue is that with the cirrhosis, there's a decrease in the synthesis of bile fats, which are used for the absorption of fat-soluble vitamins, such as vitamin A, D, E, and K. Vitamin K is involved in the clotting factors, and a lack of this vitamin will leading, lead to bleeding and bruising, all of the above. Um, and that can be really dangerous, as we were talking about the esophageal varices that are at risk for rupture due to the high pressure 
and then this patient is also at risk for bleeding. So if there's a rupture, you can just um, imagine um, all the bleeding that could occur due to their lack of vitamin K. Also, jaundice occurs in the liver um, when it is unable to metabolize bilirubin, and the excess bilirubin, bilirubin is circulating in the bloodstream, and it leads to this jaundice or yellow discoloration of the skin. The edema and fibrosis of the liver and bile ducts limit the bilirubin excretion, so it is, it's just circulating through the system, unable to be excreted. Hepatic encephalopathy occurs when the damaged liver is unable to excrete toxins from the body, and they build up in the brain and affect cognitive function. Ammonia, a toxin formed during the metabolism of amino acids, can accumulate in the brain and cause confusion. And the confusion, depending on the level of toxins in the brain, it can be from some fatigue and some confusion to coma. It, it has a wide range of effects. Also, according to Mozos here, the heart is one of the most adversely affected organs in patients with liver cirrhosis. Cirrhosis increases one's risk of developing an arrhythmia such as atrial fibrillation or flutter due to the cirrhotic cardiomyopathy and electrolyte imbalances. So what will a person with cirrhosis look like? What will they present with? So we already talked about the jaundice, uh, the yellow discoloration of the skin. It also affects the sclera in the eyes and mucous membranes due to the high levels of bilirubin. Um, pruritus or itching is due to the bile salt particles and high bilirubin levels within the skin. And bloating in the abdomen can occur due to the um, increased portal hypertension and fluid ac accumulation in the abdomen. And due to that pressure in the abdomen from the ascites, um, the patient will experience some nausea, vomiting, loss of appetite, weight loss, Malnutrition may also be seen in patients with alcoholic cirrhosis that consume more alcohol than nutritional food. Um, so good to check the nutritional status um, in this patient. Also due to the hepatic encephalopathy, there can be the fatigue and um, like we said, it can range from fatigue to um, cognitive impairments to a coma. And also due to that hy um, portal hypertension, there is fluid accumulation in the legs, which causes edema um, besides the uh, fluid in the abdomen. You're, due to the high pressures and the fluid leaking out of the vessels, there um, is edema that forms as well. To diagnose cirrhosis, uh, there are various tests and labs that can be performed. First off, the provider can assess the liver. Um, a patient with cirrhosis will have some hardening of their liver as due to the fibrosis and um, the changes in the structure of the liver. The ascites may form as the fluid accumulates in the abdomen. Also, you can perform blood tests to check the liver enzymes, which will be elevated based on inflammation and the liver function and the splenomegaly like we said will kind of hold on to the white blood cells and platelets so you will see a decrease in those values um, with a blood test. The provider can also stage um, the liver disease. Is it in an early stage? Has it progressed to a late stage? Um, and you test the bilirubin, the in the bloodstream, the creatinine would show the kidney function, and the INR would also um, tell you how easily the patient will bleed, how likely are they to clot um, due to their lack of vitamin K if they do have cirrhosis. Also, the provider can check for hepatitis B and C, which could possibly be the cause of the liver damage. Uh, a liver biopsy is a main way for providers 
to um, identify and confirm the diagnosis of cirrhosis, um, but it can also identify the cause of the liver damage as well, even though it is an invasive procedure. And imaging studies such as ultrasound, computerized tomography, magnetic resonance imaging, and elastography are used to identify the splenomegaly, esophageal varices, and changes in the liver structure. Here are some references for you guys. Let me know if you have any questions, um, and I'll be happy to answer those for you. Hope you guys have a good day.